a joke taken too seriously, a couple of overly supportive friends, and a strange case of daddy issues take the stage in this strange anthology. A mysterious host warns the viewers that what they're about to witness is not for the faint-hearted. He begins with the story of the Thompsons, a young American couple having their game night. Bert and his wife welcome their friends to their house. They start to dance and play games until one of their friends jokes and says, that's what she said. Bert then asks who she is, and the group remains silent. One of his friends wonders if he's serious about asking it, so Bert says no. However, Bert grows anxious for the rest of the night until their friends leave. While Bert takes a shower, he is still bothered by the statement. Later, Bert searches the internet to see who she is, but to no avail. The next day, while outside, Bert zones out, looking at every woman they walk past, still wondering who she is. Bert then creates an evidence board to uncover who she is. Later on, a fully inked Bert sews something, making his wife worry. When asked what's going on, Bert doesn't respond. She points out the dirty dishes and his urine jars, yet Bert is unbothered, laughing hysterically. He utters, the dishes, to which his wife confirms that's what she said. This catches the crazed Bert's curiosity. He stands up and blabs about his strange dilemma, trying to figure out who she is. He starts accusing her of being she, which makes his wife scared. Crying, his wife apologizes as she doesn't know what he means. She begs to have her husband back. So Bert also apologizes and admits that he's been acting weird. He then declares that he'll do the dishes, but his wife still feels uneasy. Bert tells her that he could use a hand, so he grabs her and forces her hand into the garbage disposal. Suddenly, the doorbell rings, stopping them. They realize that it's game night again, so their friends enjoy the night with his wife, but Bert just leaves the room. Later, Bert reveals himself to his guest, wearing a mask, and claims that he is she. Shocked, his wife pleads for someone to call 911. Soon, Bert is tied up on the stretcher, laughing hysterically. The EMT injects with medicine, so Bert calms down and says, that feels good. Hearing this, the EMT jokingly says, that's what she said, which makes Bert scream. The driver, who is the host, hears Bert and complains that nothing good ever happens after 10 p.m. He then proceeds to tell Edna's story, who's full of dreams that never came true. In her kitchen, Edna wallows in her sadness and thinks that things will get better if she had a man to get through life with. The next day at a restaurant, Edna zones out while her friends Lucy and Allison talk. Since she doesn't want to live anymore, she decides to end her life. While preparing to throw herself off the bridge, something grabs Edna's attention, so she runs towards it. She pulls a bag out of the river and discovers a corpse inside. This makes Edna smile. Not long after, Edna brings the corpse to her house and bonds with him. She then decides to name him Ricky. That night, Edna dances with Ricky, happy that she finally has a man to get through life with. Ricky is her ideal man, as he's a good listener, a shoulder to lean on, a strong silent type, and the prom date Edna never had. Contrary to Ricky, who's dead, Edna feels alive. The next day at the restaurant, Edna meets with her friends and brings Ricky with her. Lucy and Allison, however, feel uneasy as Edna interacts with him. Allison tries to make conversation with Ricky, but Edna claims that he's shy. Having had enough, Lucy blurts out that Ricky's dead, annoying Edna. She passively tells Lucy to let her be happy for once, but Lucy defends that she'd be happy if she brings a real man. Edna begs her to stop, and Allison sees Ricky's head fall off, which makes her and Lucy disgusted. Because of this, Lucy advises Edna not to continue her relationship with Ricky and worries about her mental health. Edna gets angry, so she and Ricky leave. While getting ready to sleep, she asks Ricky if he wants to go to the beach. Edna knows that he doesn't like to be in the water, so she waits for his decision. However, the next day, Edna and Ricky don't go to the beach. She stays in bed reading a book as her friend's comments plague her. Suddenly, she comes up with an idea. That night, Edna and Ricky arrive at the Critica County Hospital. With Ricky resting on the table, Edna concocts a formula. She closes Ricky's eyes and injects the green fluid into his neck. While she's waiting, Ricky returns to life and examines himself. When Edna notices, she stands in disbelief. When asked what happened, Edna tells him that she brought him back to life. Ricky thinks this is cool. The next morning, Ricky reveals that his actual name is Cider, which means a liquor derived from the fruits. Edna is fascinated by this and reveals that she's been calling him Ricky but he prefers his real name as it's part of his core. Edna agrees and thinks that renaming him is crazy. At the diner, Edna expresses that she likes grilled cheese, but Cider claims that it's fattening. He compliments the place, but points out that it's capitalizing for the young generation, yet they don't have vegan options. Edna wonders if he's vegan, which Cider says he's not, stressing that one doesn't need to be vegan to care. The next day, Cider shows off his outfit and shares its history while Edna just nods along. Afterward, Cider plays his own music, 
which he claims that he spent years with Russian homeless people to produce. Edna, however, is growing tired of her supposed boyfriend's antics. Having had enough, Edna looks at a knife on the counter. Cider's favorite part of the music comes up, so he dances. Edna then gets the knife and hides it on her back. She sways as she goes near Cider, who's dancing suggestively. While at it, Edna grabs the chance and slices Cider's neck. Uncontented, Edna continuously stabs him on the floor. She then pulls Cider toward the river where she first saw him. The host notes that Edna has decided not to depend her happiness on another human again. He then tells his next story, which is about friendship. With weapons and masks on, Luke, Jimmy, and Chris walk inside a supermarket. Luke opens fire, rattling the customers. He declares everyone to go out and scares them. Jimmy holds the store clerk captive, who asks why they're doing this. One week earlier, at a restaurant, Luke and Jimmy tried to get Chris to approach the woman at the other table. Chris got annoyed at his friends for pushing him, but they defended that they were just trying to help him. Chris revealed that he didn't want to talk to the girl. He then accused Luke and Jimmy of projecting what they wanted to do to him, which made his friends laugh. In Jimmy's defense, he told Chris that they were just helping him make out with someone. This made Chris laugh, but he revealed that his problem was complicated. Chris admitted that he hadn't been able to reach the climax since he was 14. He saw a burglar stealing their items and felt aroused. He added that he felt more intense whenever the burglar's breathing got heavier. Concerned, Luke then thought of an idea. That night, in his house, Chris was in the restroom when he heard something. Checking around, he found his friends wearing stockings as masks. Jimmy flashed him with a light, then Luke asked him if he got excited, to which Chris replied no. On another night, Chris went to his car, where his friends tried and failed to scare him. The following day, Luke and Jimmy planned how to help Chris. Back at the supermarket, Jimmy knocks the clerk's head on the counter, asking if Chris feels something. Scared, Chris tells him no, so Luke punches a customer. Chris opposes their actions, which gets Luke angry, so he uses his weapon to completely knock out the customer. Chris screams at Luke out of fear when suddenly, Luke notices a laser targeting Chris. They immediately get down as the police enter the supermarket. While hiding, Luke apologizes to Chris for causing trouble, but he tells him that it wasn't a mistake. He then happily shows Luke his crotch, confirming their mission is a success. While the police walk toward them, Jimmy announces that they have to go. The police take notice and demand them not to do it. Jimmy and Luke stand up and position their rifles. The police open fire, so a shooting ensues between them. Jimmy gets shot, and Luke continues firing. Chris then approaches him, assuring him that he appreciates what they'd done for him. He then throws his weapon and walks while aroused. Luke then collapses, realizing that he's been shot. He and the police stop and watch Chris, who stands up at the counter, finally reaching his climax. Elsewhere, a delivery man named Vic Ward drops off a package at a store. When he returns to his motorcycle, he sees a package addressed to someone with whom he shares his name. Vic gets surprised but drives off to send the package. He soon arrives at a remote area and sees a part of the house that's dome-shaped. Vic enters and calls the receiver to get his signature. The receiver, however, dares Vic to look for him. Vic then enters the man's workstation, where he meets an old man and sees a timer counting down for 100 minutes. Upon seeing him, the old man says, Wow, and nods approvingly. He then tells Vic that he might be wondering why he's carrying a package addressed to him. Vic thinks that it might be a coincidence and asks how he knows his name. The man then tells him that, in order not to disturb the space-time continuum, they need to have both of their DNA combined. When asked what he's talking about, the old man then tells him that an asteroid will fall on Earth once the countdown finishes. Vic then judges the man as crazy. The old man reveals that he's Vic from the future and that Vic is his past self. He adds that to stop the asteroid, they must combine their DNA. Confused, Vic asks if he'll pull his hair out, but the old man says that what he'll do is complicated. Tired, Vic just asks him to sign the package, but the old man refuses, so he decides to leave. Outside, Vic is unable to start his motorcycle, and his phone isn't getting enough signal to make a call, so he goes back to the man's home. The old man tells him it's fate. However, Vic thinks he's being held captive. He then notices a scar on the old man's wrist that's similar to his. Realizing what the man is suggesting, Vic clarifies that he refuses to mate with him. The old man insists, as it's the only way that he's going to get out. Having had enough, Vic decides to hitchhike in the dark but just ends up in the ruined tent next door. The old man approaches and tries to comfort Vic, but he tells him to shut up. The old man mentions that their birthdays are coming and shares that he has the good stuff, but Vic refuses. The old man continues making suggestive remarks, to which Vic strongly declines. He then suggests going inside, assuring him that he won't do anything. Inside the house, the old man tempts Vic, but to no avail since he insists he has a beautiful girlfriend at home. When the old man hints that his girlfriend is cheating on him, Vic decides to leave, but the old man tells him to open the package first. Vic takes the package and opens it, 
finding his childhood drawing of a super happy kid, which surprises him. Vic runs toward the house, feeling heroic. He approaches the old man, and they get intimate just before the countdown ends. Afterward, he throws up outside and starts his motorcycle. Before he leaves, he sees a cab stopping in front of the house. From the vehicle, a pizza delivery guy steps out. Before he could question what was happening, Vic just leaves. The old man closes Vic's social media account from his computer and removes the fake scar on his wrist. He then restarts his timer to 30 minutes to make things more interesting. The pizza delivery guy walks in, and the old man turns. Once again, he says, wow, and nods approvingly. On the other side of town, the host introduces a group of Italian mobsters. Tutti, Tony, Lucky, and Jimmy happily gather at the table. Tony jokes that men grow mustaches to look like their mothers, and his friends laugh. Suddenly, Tutti sarcastically mentions that he's interested in Tony's mother. This makes the rest stop laughing. Tony asks Tutti if he wants to get with his mother, but Tutti doesn't respond, feeling uneasy. Tony then laughs and tells Tutti he was joking, relieving the tension. Outside, Tony walks, looking serious. Lucky and Jimmy accompany Tootie when they suddenly beat him up and throw him into the car's trunk. That night, the mobsters bring Tootie to Tony's parents' room. Tony approaches his ill father, who is unable to speak. Tony's mother then enters the room and greets them. Fulfilling Tootie's desires, Tony reveals to his mother that Tootie wants to sleep with her. Tootie feels scared and attempts to leave, but Lucky holds him. Tony's mother asks Tootie if it's true, to which Tony confirms. He then demands Tootie to go with his mother and do it, so Tootie hesitantly walks to her. Tony's mother taunts him, so Tootie enters the room and starts getting intimate with her. The men watch them, and Tony's father lets out a big smile, uttering the word, Mama. In another story, Sam and a woman eat at a restaurant for their blind date. Sam mentions that their date is going great since they even finish each other's sentences. The woman reveals that it's hard to date in her location and shares that she's been on a blind date with a blind guy. She stresses that there's nothing wrong with it, but she wasn't given a heads up. The woman then gets some powder, which she shares with Sam. Sam snorts it, and she reveals that he just snorted her father's ashes. This surprises Sam, but his date continues to eat and clarifies that she got it from the crematorium. Sam calmly points out that her father's ashes are in his throat, so she tells him that it's great and proceeds to compliment him. However, Sam decides that the woman is a psycho. After dinner, the woman suggests continuing with more activities, but Sam makes up an excuse to leave. The next day, Sam buys a milk carton from a convenience store. The store clerk asks if he wants to put it in a bag, but Sam responds with a dad joke. When offered something, Sam responds with a dad joke again. In his car, Sam sees himself in the rearview mirror with wrinkles on his face. He also notices that his hair is falling out. Afraid, Sam convinces himself that he'll be okay, but sees a teenager in a car giving him the finger. Offended, Sam follows the teenager's car, driving slowly. When Sam gets out of his car, the teenagers take a video of him. He slowly walks toward them. However, he slips, making them laugh. With his voice sounding old, Sam taunts the teenagers and falls. Realizing something is wrong, Sam heads to the woman's house, not noticing that he's going bald. Inside, he looks at a picture of a couple and sees himself in the mirror, saying that he looks like Benjamin Franklin. He then sees the woman with a knife in her hand. Seeing him, the woman freezes then reacts that he went home early. Sam confirms and starts rambling nonsense. Suddenly, Sam acts like a father and nags at the woman, who acts as if she's his daughter. He then demands the woman to go to a room, so she pouts and leaves. Sam then sits and sleeps on the couch. After some time, Sam wakes up and goes to the woman's room, where he sees her jumping on her bed. Scared, he rushes out but trips, so he tries to crawl his way while the woman follows him. He heads downstairs but struggles to open the front door. With the woman at the steps, he runs and escapes through another door, where he falls into the basement. Downstairs, he notices a door and opens it. Inside are more men, including a blind man, who greet him as Daddy. The men then put an apron on Sam, and he starts grilling barbecue with them. Meanwhile, the woman sips a drink in the kitchen while the host laughs by the front door, saying that was fun. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.